Kingdom Church. Now, if this were not the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, working this world was a church as a prophet who was also the president of the church. It's assisted by two counselors. They believe that just as there were 12 apostles in the primitive church, so today there should be 12 apostles in the Latter-day Saints Church. Other leaders assist in administrative work, but altogether, these men constitute the general authorities of the church. The headquarters are in Salt Lake City, Utah. You've heard it in Marvel, that's a great part of sin, but what do they teach and believe about God, Jesus, and the Bible? The guests today on the John Underwood Show are both former Mormons. First, Mrs. Sandra Taylor, my great great granddaughter of Brigham Young. Sandra and her husband Joe have written the massive book Mormonism, Shadow or Reality, documenting the contradictions and errors they found in the Mormon scriptures. Sandra will reveal the evidence that led her away from Mormonism to the biblical view of Jesus. John's second guest is Marvin Cohen. Marvin was a Zealous Mormon who one day was challenged to examine the claims of Mormonism. The evidence he investigated led him out of the Mormon church and into a personal faith with the historic biblical Jesus he did not know as a Mormon. He documents the evidence that led him to this conclusion in his book, Mormon Claims Answer. Tonight, please join John for this exciting program. Welcome to our program this week. We have two very special guests. And uh, Senator and Marvin, you've been watching our program with some of the representatives of the Mormons that we've had in the preceding two weeks. And you know, I couldn't help but think that when I'm sitting there talking with these men and we're answering some of the questions and when we were pushing them just a little bit, that they were holding back information. I don't know that much about Mormon doctrine. But you too, let me ask you this story. Do you think when they were asking some of those questions, that they were completely finished with me? I feel they were deliberately hedging their answers. They were not forthright on their teachings. Uh, we're going to find out what. But you folks have come out of Mormonism. You have spent most of your life as Mormons. We have a great, great granddaughter of Brother Mormon sitting right here with us. And yet, now, you have left Mormonism and you have embraced Jesus Christ in a new way. And to start off with you folks, I'm asking the question what is Mormonism based on? Who is it set with? What are the claims? Well, I think uh, that uh, Joseph Field Smith, the tenth prophet of the Mormon Church, kind of sums that up uh, here on page 188 of volume one of the Doctrine of Salvation. When he says that Mormonism, as it's called, must stand or fall on the story of Joseph Smith. He was either a prophet of God, divinely called, properly appointed, and commissioned, or he was one of the biggest frauds this world has ever seen. There is no middle ground. And so he's the prophet of God. But everything is a scope of faith. Is he the only prophet? Well, they've had you know, those who succeed him, but even in Scripture, in the Doctrine and Covenants section 135, verse 3, says that Joseph Smith, the prophet and seer of the Lord, has done more, so Jesus only for the salvation of men in this world than any other man that ever lived in. Okay, what was before Joseph Smith? In other words, was the church in existence before Joseph Smith? Well, they feel that uh, when Christ set up his church, he set it up with 12 apostles, but that very shortly within the next one or two hundred years, the church fell into apostasy and remained so for the next 1,800 years until Joseph Smith restored it and until he started his church that was known with authority to act for God on the earth. So all the churches at that time were in a state of apostasy and totally wrong. So, did they have an existence or is that a question that was following God's will by many times or is it completely blank? Well, they, the Mormons would have conceded they went to heaven, but you have to understand how the Mormons divide up heaven. So that heaven has three compartments, the top one for the Mormons, and the second one for the good people of the world, and the bottom one for the wicked of the world. But it's all part of heaven. So the people could have gone to heaven, but they wouldn't have gone to the top place where the Mormons uh, want to go. Okay, I want to come back to that too, and find a little bit more clear. I want to go Joseph Smith actually do to get this business I mean, he was the head of one of the most powerful churches in our country. To go back to him, how did he come about? Well, Joseph Smith claimed that uh, 
when he was a young man, about 14 years old, that he went out and was to pray to know which church was right. And supposedly, God and Christ appeared to him and told him they were all wrong, and he was called to start the church. However, there are a number of problems with his story. Uh, we can show that in his early teen life, he was engaged in witchcraft and as a medium in uh, occult practices. And uh, this is all during the time when he supposedly is working on his Book of Mormon. It doesn't seem to lay a very good foundation for the start of Mormonism. He was involved in what they call money digging, and he would use a seer stone to do this. And so uh, he was taken to court for being a glass worker. This means he used a stone in a hand. They pulled the hat up over his face and looked at the stone, and he could discern for you where there was treasure buried on your property. And so for a certain fee, you could hire him to divine for you hidden treasures. And he had actually taken the court for this, and we have a photograph of the uh, court document, and this is uh, actually a certified copy from the state of New York. Where he was tried, and it says right so, so here, Joseph Smith, the glass looker, March 20, 1826, he's charged with a misdemeanor. Crystal ball gaze, and it's the same as glass looking. Now, this happened. Did he look into these glass and he saw things? Yes, he looked in there and he'd see if there was uh, uh, gold buried on your property, someone left their jewels. Under your oak tree or something, and he could tell you how far it did. He was actually brought to court for that. Yeah. Okay. How does that fit into the story of the Roman Church? Well, when we look into the translation of the Book of Mormon, we find that much of the translation was done to the same medium. And Mormons will talk about the Urban Common for the translation process. But if we go back into the descriptions by the early witnesses that were there with Joseph Smith, they all talk about his seer stone, this little thing that he had in his hand. And that's how he translated the bulk of the Book of Mormon was with this stone. So you know, like, right, right, but what's your name? We take that from the Old Testament where the high priest used this to determine a yes or no answer on something. And uh, the Mormons have lifted this phrase and we are saying that. Uh, the Urban Thummer was a special instrument saved with the Book of Mormon plates so that whoever finally dug up the plates would have the means to translate them. But the Urban Thummer, in fact, wasn't really used for the bulk of the Book of Mormon translation. He really used this stone that was just a, a crystal that he found in the well. I understand. How does the stone talk to you? Or how did you look at the stone to see things? And what, is, what did he do? Yeah, it's also like a television screen. And he just saw that he was in the stone. Yeah, the stone would be writing up. When he was in the Book of Mormon, the said that the writing for the Book of Mormon would appear on the stone, and he would read off the translation to his scribe. And so as he would uh, be reading, there would be a scribe writing all these things down. Mark's got his book. This is an address for our believers in Christ by David Whitmer, one of the three witnesses of the Book of Mormon. Mm-hmm. And on page 12, he's telling what uh, Sam is talking about. Mm-hmm. So he's a little bit. All right. Mm-hmm. He says, Joseph Smith would put the seal stone into a hat and put his face in the hat, wearing it closely around his face to exclude the light. In the darkness, the spiritual light would shine. A piece of something resembling parchment would appear. And on that appeared the writing, one character at a time would appear under and under it. The interpretation in English. Brother Joseph would read off the English to Oliver Cowdery, who was his principal scribe, and when it was written down and repeated to Brother Joseph to see if it was correct, then it would disappear, and another character with the interpretation would appear. Thus, the Book of Mormon was translated by the gift of power of God and not by any power of man. When you were in Mormon, both of you were Mormon, did you know this? Did you know that that's how he translated the Book of Mormon? No, I didn't know that. Do you think the most Mormon said you know this? No. Because it's embarrassing to have him connected up with uh, uh, something that's so close to crystal ball gazing. I have seen that uh, he looked through his kind of crystal ball or through his stone and he read these revelations. Is this how the Book of Mormon came into being? Yeah, that's the majority of the, what we have in the Book of Mormon today. 
uh, this is the, uh, the three books of scripture, the Book of Mormon, Doctrine and Covenants, Pearl and Great Christ. And uh, the Book of Mormon is supposed to be a translation of uh, these records, and that's the way he's supposed to translate it. But the problem with that is that it contradicts uh, Deuteronomy 18, verses uh, 10 through 12, where it talks against those that use divination or any observer of times or an enchanter or a witch or a charmer or a consulter with familiar spirits or a wizard or a necromancer. For all that do these things are an abomination unto the Lord. And yet that's exactly what we have Joseph Smith doing, is using a sorcery type of instrument for what he claims to be scripture. Okay. Now what do we do with the Bible? Just, just a bit briefly, what, what do we do with the Bible? Well, that's the word of God as far as it's translated correctly. What does that mean? Because it sounds great, but there seems to be a hook thing somewhere. Well, there is. Uh, whatever we don't want to believe isn't translated correctly is what it boils down to. Is there anything that you bring up that can't be answered in the country that we're going to come to? When you point out that the Bible would say that it's not true, they would say that the Bible has been corrupted by this false text by a scrub up, a false church going down to the Middle Ages and so on, and it's just a story of himself. Mormon bookstore today, 
they would have in there six volumes that called History of the Church. And it would say, author written by Joseph Smith, but he didn't see right, but he didn't write it. He was made 40 percent. 40 percent of it. Who would do the 60 percent? His uh, successors, so uh, the Brigham Young and the Mormons that came out west after Joseph Smith died, they put this together using all the different journals. They said, well, I think it was a, uh, a terrible discussion to play on all of us. Uh, it's been a struggle for myself and my family to go back and try to reconstruct how Mormonism really happened because men like Brigham Young have distorted and lied, covered up, and changed what really happened. Okay, so people are not going to be going to religion or something. What's so, what's so important about this church history? Well, let's let's wait for the whole thing that we come right now. What we're interested in is why is the Mormon church and the answer so interested in church history? What does it matter? I mean, it's always the two of but why are they so particular? So it's going to be correct. Thank you. Well, I know you said it's made about it, but Joseph Hilary Smith, the chief prophet, made a statement that it's the most accurate history in the world, right into the doctrine of salvation. And um, uh, the reason that he's concerned about being accurate is it's the matter of the restoration of the one and only true church to the earth. And if that's not accurate, then how can you understand the truth about God or whatever else it is you're going to tell us? It's like the book of Acts in the Testament talking about the church. It's the church in the church of history. What we're seeing here is apparently the truth of Christ. Right. It's the words of the book where it says Christ. That's the truth. Well, in uh, the uh, bringing forth of the Book of Mormon, it says in the uh, Church History today that the angel that came and appeared to Joseph Smith was Moroni. But if you go back to the original printing of Church History, it says Nephi. The difference being, Nephi is the first man that appears on the scene in the Book of Mormon story, and Moroni is the last man that appears on the Book of Mormon scene. And uh, Joseph Smith first told it that it was the first man in the book, Nephi, that appeared to him. Then later he changed the name to this other being. But when you see this type of changing going on, then you wonder, well, is he making this up as he goes along? Is he really recounting actual events to us? When you have to go back and rewrite things, then you're left wondering if it ever really happened. Okay. The church history has, in a sense, been rewritten. I've seen some of the documents that you've had. Do you want to throw something from your book there in terms of the changes that have been made in the text? Not only did they rewrite the history after Joseph Smith was passed out for season, but then the history that was written under his name in the first person when he wasn't there, even then, you saw the documentation that that history has been cleaned up as a dog. Is that correct? Right. Some of the involved in this also is like his changes in his revelation. This is a photo of the first printing of one of his revelations in book form. The changes noted in the margin are the changes you would have to supply to make it read like the current printing. TC means textual change. What are the words that are? Words that have words deleted and textual change. Okay. So this is a sample of how we are rewriting things. We have uh, other examples. Uh, that's, a, that's another example of how they have changed the revelation. They have taken this whole section out and added these words in, which makes a curious position of God revealing things to you when God not only has to go back later and rewrite it, he withdraws a paragraph and inserts a paragraph. And this is indicative of the whole history of Mormonism. This is the way they handled their church history. One of those revelations was that Joseph Smith was going to have to give a translation for the Book of Mormon, and then it was to be told to us to. Yes, that was his uh, first one, and so. Uh, supposedly, God told Joseph Smith that the only gift he had was to translate the Book of Mormon, and he wasn't going to be given any other gift. And that's when Joseph printed that revelation in 1833. 
but then he took it was pretty that he evidently had ideas of expanding his work. So he realized the revelation. Two years later, he republishes it, and it now says this is the first gift that God gave him. So he opens Pandora's box for him to go on with ever whatever he wants to add to the doctrines later on. He's actually a bit of this revelation that's right there. And that's what he's not known about the Jacobs, do they? No, I never knew last time that we went into it that there were different printings of the revelations that anything had ever been changed. How did you feel when you realized that you'd been swimming? Oh, angry, disappointed, hurt. Um, yeah, did you find it? I mean, what did you find it? Did you just look at that and say, I mean, what did you find it? What persuaded you that your research was correct? Well, I had photographs of the documents. And uh, as I laid them out to the side of a current doctrine of Calvinists, uh, it wasn't a matter of arguing with an individual. There was a photograph of the book. It doesn't read the same as it does now. It's a movie that really wants to take it to Yes, at the uh, Salt Lake City at the University of Utah in their library. They have the originals of all these books. Anyone can go in there and see them. Well, let's talk a little bit about it. Okay. What Joseph Smith, because he's a founder, okay, what he said about God. Well, first of all, um, I assume you don't believe that God has one. Right. Well, so that's one of the tenets of Mormonism. But a lot of Mormons don't even realize this. I think it's sweet in the program. I think it's President Blake or President Christensen said what happens to the question what is there a God to mind? That's the best thing we have. No, uh, nothing to say about that. What are you talking about? Gospel Principles is the official Mormon Church Sunday School Manual. This is put out by the Mormon Church. Okay. So I'm not about as authoritative, I guess, as you could get. If you went to Mormon Sunday School, this is what you're going to be studying. In the first lesson, it says, Our heavenly parents desire to share their joy with us. And it says, our heavenly parents provided us with a celestial home more glorious and beautiful than any place on earth. We were happy there, yet they knew that we could not progress beyond a certain point unless we left them for a time. They wanted us to develop every godlike quality that they have. And as this on, it says, then we would receive immortal bodies like those of our heavenly parents. Okay, so,
some of these things before we hear your story. Last week, you left us with the fact that Joseph Smith, the founder, the prophet of the Mormon Church, in Revelations, was telling Mormons what to believe about God. And we were saying, and he said, exactly what we're used to hearing. In fact, uh, do most of the Mormons really understand Mormon doctrine? I mean, would the majority know what we're going to divulge right now? Well, it depends on how active they are. A Mormon that is actively going to the temple, is actively teaching an adult level class, is uh, familiar with the idea of God having a wife and our pre existence and our eventual goal of becoming a God. But a lot of Mormons don't know that doctrine. I've talked to Mormons in Salt Lake that don't know that doctrine. Uh, let's start the beginning. I see you say, God the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit are one God and three persons. What do you want to say? Well, uh, here, for example, on page 370 of the teaching of the prophet Joseph Smith, Smith comes out and flatly says that these three personages constitute uh, three personages and three gods. So they don't believe in monotheism. They don't believe in one god in the sense that Christians do. When they say they believe in one god, they say the god of this world. Is that correct? Yes. But there are actually many other gods out there. Is that correct? There's millions of them. Zeus, and there are actually three gods that are involved with us in this world. One is God the Father, and the other is strictly another God all by himself, God the Son, Jesus, okay, and then God the Holy Spirit. Three separate gods rolling out there, correct? Right? God the Holy Ghost. God the Holy Ghost, okay. But not the Holy Spirit. Does that make a difference? Yes, there's a differentiation there, yes. The Holy Ghost is a personage, whereas the Holy Spirit is not. Okay, what is the Holy Spirit? Well, it's defined as, as being more like... Uh, Molecules, uh, if you start in the space, the Holy Ghost can use the Holy Spirit to accomplish the purposes of God. But uh, the Holy Ghost and the Holy Spirit are not one and the same. Okay. In terms of these three gods, you asked me the question last week do I believe that God the Father had a wife? And I said, no, I haven't heard anything like that. Now let me ask you this is that what they're saying? Yes. Thank you know, for me. Where in the world are they saying that? As I showed you last week, it's in uh, their Sunday school manual where it talks about um, God and uh, his wife, and since it talks about heavenly parents. Uh, did you have a quote on that, too? Uh, yeah, from the seer, Apostle Larson Pratt says um, the father and mother of Jesus, according to flesh, must have been associated together in the past of husband and wife. Hence, the Virgin Mary must have been for the time being the lawful wife of God the Father. Holy, oh, holy. Oh. Wait a minute. Mary, Mary was the another wife? That, that's not the mother wife I was talking about. Hold on now. This is a mother wife. How many wives has God have? Well, if you get Mary, I guess he's got at least two. Okay, keep going. Well, uh, here he's, uh, he's saying that uh, we use like, the uh, term lawful wife because it would be blasphemous in the highest degree to say that he was. Uh, um, that, that he overshadowed or begat the Savior unlawfully. Now, this is, of course, dealing with the, the birth of Christ, and he's married to uh, Mary then for at least a, a, a time, lawfully. And uh, uh, let me let me hold on. Did, was Mary a pre-existent? What you call pre-existent spirit? Spirit. Something of the Heavenly Father. Right. So you have to say that. God has at least one life in heaven, right. by which He in heaven gave birth to all the spirits. We're going to come to this earth. Okay. In that group of spirits, there were you, myself, Mary. Jesus, Mary. We were all part of that family. Okay. Well, then Mary comes down to earth to be the mother of Jesus. God comes down and becomes her husband to procreate Christ. The Mormons will say to you, I believe Jesus is the literal son of the Father. Then you pin them down. How do you define literal? And a lot of Mormons will say literal, don't even understand what they're saying. But when you take into consideration, they believe God is a physical resurrected man who had an earth experience on another world, uh, was resurrected, earned his salvation, his exaltation, went on to become a God, glorified, got his wife, started his earth. Then they're saying this physical resurrected man came back to Mary. And when they say overshadow, they mean literally had intercourse with Mary to procreate Jesus. So when they say Jesus is a literal son of the Father, they mean literal. 
and that can be documented from uh, Bruce McConkie's book. Uh, okay, when we talk about these apostles, are you looking at them? Apostles are actually giving us the truth. Why? Because there's 12 apostles in the church today. We saw at the head of the program here. 12 apostles, and they are just like the 12 apostles that revolved around Jesus. And if they are actually like that, then what? Then the word should be authoritative, just like that. Just like the other apostles. Peter's an apostle. Peter's inspired. Peter's writings are taking the answer. Okay, here's another apostle, Bruce McConkie, who's alive today. And in his book, Morning Doctrine, he says, Christ was born into the world as the literal son of this holy being. He was born in the same personal, real, and literal sense that any mortal son is born to a mortal father. There is nothing figurative about his paternity. He was begotten, conceived, and born in the normal and natural course of events. For he is the son of God, and that designation means what it says. And this would take the greatest the best effect of the virgin birth that Jesus was conceived by the Holy Spirit according to Luke. Right. And why would they want the Holy Spirit to conceive Jesus? We've got to extend this out for the folks. It makes sense right now from your reading. But let's just backtrack. If God the Holy Spirit is a separate God, okay, then in essence it would not be the Son, literal Son of God the Father. It would be the literal Son of God the Holy Ghost. The Holy Ghost. Interesting. Uh, what do they do with the scripture verses in the Bible? Is that one of those verses that's just been corrupted? Yes, it is. I have more than telling me all the time that uh, the verses attributing it to the Holy Ghost are uh, mistranslated. <laughs> let's let's get this progressive again. Uh, you've got the Father, God, the Heavenly Mother, they have sex in heaven, and what they do is the byproduct is all of these spirit beings, spirit children. Okay? Now, how does a spirit children or spirit children get to this earth and get born down here? What's the process? Just <laughs> we don't know the process that just happens. You're a full grown adult spirit body in heaven. It comes your time to come to earth. We don't know what the process is, but some way you your material spirit body is put into the seed, put into the seed, and, 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 and grow into the mother's womb, and you come out. Now your spirit's encased in a physical body. It's actually compressed. It's it's like that. That. Is it it's compressed? Well, I don't know that they use the word compressed, but how is you going to get a full-size uh, material spirit body into a baby or into a cell, for that matter? I mean, it's going to be compressed. Okay. And so the physical body and the spiritual body, then they grow together. Is that correct? Yes. Now, what, what is the good of having a spiritual person inside of you or a spiritual body inside of you? Well, these are just the layers that you've got to have to go on to God. But you start out as an intelligence, you become a spirit child, then you are clothed with a physical body. You needed that physical body to go on to Godhood. So these are all part of the process. When they say that we're going on to Godhood, what does that mean? We're going to be like God? You can become a God over in Earth, exactly like the Father is a God over this Earth. You've got to admit, you know, if you're talking about reaching for a goal and being ambitious, I mean, without laughing at all, I mean, you can admit that it sounds good. If I can actually progress from being a man, to be not like God, but to be a God. What do I get to do when I become a God? We find out to do first thing in the world, but when you get to be a God, why am I working so hard to be a God? Well, then you get to run your own earth. You get to be the head man. It's a power position. You get to, you get to, get to go off and create your own world? Yes. You get to populate it? Yes. You have your own wife, mm -hmm. not the mother. Did you choose? Yes. Is that why Mormons get married in a temple? That's the whole reason for temple marriage. So you will have your wife forever with you in heaven, so you and your wife can go off and have 20 million children or whatever it takes to make an earth, and you and your wife will have all these babies born in heaven, raised into adulthood as spirits, so you can send them to your earth to go through this process so they can go on to be gods, then they will go make their earth, and they will become gods. Of course, they all have to live Mormonism, but that's the goal. Okay. Mormons will say to me, uh, Mormonism has so much to offer. Why should I leave Mormonism for what you're talking about? And I said, well, I can't offer you Godhood. All I can offer you is salvation. But I represent a company that has a better track record. I can prove my company's always existed. <laughs> I'm a little hesitant about the origin of your company. Mm -hmm. So it's just like when you go to 
by insurance, if someone offers you a $20 million policy, if there's no real insurance company behind the policy, it doesn't matter what's written on the paper. And you would say that from your research, that what you have found is just, just dead wrong. Right. All right. We're going to trace this in just a moment. We're going to take a break. When we come back, we're going to trace what's the person stopping How in the world can I become a good and go out and populate my own world and go out?
We want to welcome all of the folks uh, to our program, and Marvin Cowan and Sandra Tanner, two folks that have been Mormons most of their life, have investigated the evidence, have two solid books, actually more than that, but you have very scholarly books on Mormonism, documented their history, their doctrine, what they believe, and a comparison of that with Christianity. Marvin, I'd like to start with you tonight, and that would be you grew up in a Mormon home. Tell us a little bit about your upbringing and why it was that you were so enthusiastic to embrace the Mormon faith. Well, there were several things about Mormonism that appealed to me. Uh, of course, they had a lot of activities for young people. But uh, beyond that, the stories of Joseph Smith, his first vision, seeing God the Father and Jesus Christ, uh, seeing the angel Moroni and getting the gold plates to translate the Book of Mormon, the uh, return of John the Baptist to give the Aaronic priesthood, and uh, Peter, James, and John to give the Melchizedek priesthood, and uh, all of these stories that I heard that uh, uh, happened to Joseph Smith made me want to be like him. I, uh, I thought he was great, and I thought he had the greatest church going there was. It was the only church with the authority, and because of that, I wanted to see my friends know about it, and as I told those stories, they were enamored with them because they didn't have uh, men in their churches that were seeing God and seeing angels and so forth, and they would listen intently. And uh, So you actually thought it was a good thing? That I, I thought it was a good thing. Supernatural revelation, angels visiting the prophet, and all kinds of things. You thought this was really great. I thought it was the greatest thing on earth as okay. far as the church was concerned. Yes. And then you told your friends. Yes, I did. Did they think it was just as great? Well, uh, most of them just listened. Uh, some asked a few questions and so forth. But uh, apparently I made some impression, at least one that I know of joined the church when I was in the seventh grade. And uh, there were others that uh, listened intently, would come back with questions and so forth. And you were just thrilled with this. You yes. were just so proud to, to have converts into the Mormon church, weren't Why, you? Certainly. I thought I was doing uh, a great thing for the church and for God. From my standpoint, it was one of the most important things to be doing. And I was planning to go on a regular two-year mission at that time. And I thought, uh, this, is, this is great preparation be telling the story now. And as I continue to do that, I finally 
met some young people who were Christians, who were born again, and to challenge some of the statements that I made. Uh, for example, I made a kind of a passing statement at one time that the Bible says, as man is God once was, and as God is man may be. And uh, they said, what? Uh, where did you see that in the, in the Bible? Well, I couldn't tell them where in the Bible, but I've had many Mormons say the same thing to me in, in recent years as I've talked to them. Uh, it's an impression that you get. You hear these things so many times And you assume scripture. that the Bible says that. Yeah, you assume it's in Scripture. Mm -hmm. And uh, they challenged me finally to read the Bible. And it was uh, sort of the beginning of the end as far as uh, my own experience was concerned because as I read through the Bible, I thought I should because, you know, missionaries are supposed to read the Scriptures when they go out on their missions. And I thought, well, this would be a good experience to get ready for that mission. And as I read through the Old Testament, there were lots of things I didn't understand, and some of the, the statements about God, like uh, Sandra mentioned in the other program about um, uh, before me there was no God form, neither shall there be after me, or Isaiah uh, 44, verse 8, uh, uh, is there a God beside me, yea, there is no God. I know not any. God's saying that, and I thought... Because God was saying he was one, and as a Mormon, you believe there are many, many thousands of gods out there. Yeah, there were uh, many gods, although I only worship God the Father, supposedly, and of course, Christ had his place and the Holy Ghost his place, but uh, uh, why didn't God admit, you know, that there were other gods was the question that ran through my mind. Uh -huh. But as I continued to read, uh, I got so many questions that I decided I better read the Mormon uh, scriptures, that is the Book of Mormon, Doctrine and Covenants, Pearl of Great Price. The they unique hold scripture. that as being equal to the Bible as scripture. Yes, it's equal to, and in fact, uh, in actual fact, it works out that it's superior because those are not qualified. What are their scriptures again? The Book of Mormon, the Doctrine and Covenants, and the Pearl of Great Price. Those books are not qualified. McConkie, for example, says we're, we are to accept those without qualification. The Bible is to be accepted with reservation. That Who's McConkie? Uh, he's that apostle that wrote Mormon doctrine and, uh, well, he's written And as an things. apostle, he can write authoritatively for the, the, yes. the Mormon church. Okay, and what did he write? Uh, that um, the Bible has to be qualified. It's the Word of God only as far as it's translated correctly. The other books uh, were given in English, so they don't have to be qualified. You accept them at face value. They are the Word of God. So they interpret what you read in the Bible. And if the Bible doesn't jive with the interpretation, then the interpretation takes precedence. Well, actually, yes. The, the prophet today is the one with the ultimate authority to interpret the Scripture. Uh, and uh, Because the Mormon Church believes the prophet is like prophets in, of old. Yes, Isaiah, Jeremiah, only he's, uh, he's superior he's to us. He's the mouthpiece for God living today. on the earth right now. Yes. And he can give revelation from God right now. Right now, okay. yes. And in that sense, what he says is more important than previous prophets or any scripture. And what bothered you about this as you read on? Well, uh, somehow I've gotten the impression that God ought to be consistent. Uh, if he said something, he would stand by it. And I began to see some inconsistencies. For example, uh, it was at that time, as I read the Book of Mormon through for the first time, uh, even though I had been told that, uh, and I had read, that the Book of Mormon is the keystone of our religion, and a man would get nearer to God by abiding by its precepts than by any other book. Joseph Smith said that. It's in the teachings of the prophet Joseph Smith on uh, page 194. But uh, I read the Book of Mormon, and instead of undergirding my faith, it was destroying it, because every doctrine that's unique to Mormonism uh, is undermined by the Book of Mormon, whether it's the Trinity or God uh, being a... Well, give me, uh, some, give me some actual spots. What does the Book of Mormon say about the Trinity? Well, uh, 2 Nephi 31, 21, Mormon 7, 7, Al Alma 11, 44, all say uh, these three are one God. Uh, so they agree with Christianity and the Bible that point, at that point. Yes. But uh, other books, such as what? The teachings of the prophet Joseph Smith, page 370, says these three are three gods. So you have a contradiction right in the books that they call our scripture. What else? Well, uh, the, the whole idea of um, God uh, being uh, a person of flesh and bones, like uh, section 130, verse 22 in the Doctrine and Covenants says. Uh, the that book God had a flesh and bones body? Yes. That's what it says in Mormon scripture. What does the Book of Mormon say? Well, the Book of Mormon in Alma chapter 18 says God is that great spirit that created everything. And Another uh, contradiction. Give me another one. Well, uh, the um, uh, idea of, of more gods than one. In Alma chapter 11, uh, an angel tells this uh, prophet that uh, there's only one God. He says this was revealed to him. And um, 
Uh, yet Mormonism says uh, men can become gods. There are literally innumerable gods. So as you saw these contradictions in the Mormon scriptures themselves, what started happening in your life? I began to have some very uneasy feelings. Uh, in fact, I was getting to the point I didn't know what to believe. Whenever I talked to my superiors in the priesthood, uh, they would tell me I just needed to take it by faith. I don't need to do all of this study and so forth, but I was too far into it. Did anybody ever tell you just go out and pray about it? Oh, yes. Yeah, but you went out and prayed it. about it, and you still realized when you came back you had a contradiction there. Yeah, the, the prayer didn't take away the problem that I had become aware of, and right. it was that that I had to deal with. So then what did you do? I continued my study, and of course I prayed as, as well as uh, study. I was looking. I was looking desperately. In fact, I, I suspect that had some Christian just sat down with me and talked to me, uh, I would have been ready to have listened long before I became a Christian. But nobody was there at that particular time. So I just continued to read and to study. And as I read through all of the various books, I began to see that uh, there were some things I just couldn't reconcile. And I was really on the verge of uh, saying it's impossible to know. Uh, but I, at this time, was finishing up reading the Bible, and I guess the book of Acts was one of the first ones that really began to, to get to me, where it tells us what those New Testament disciples were preaching. Acts 5.42, for example, daily in the temple and in every house, they ceased not to teach and preach Jesus Christ. Well, I look back at what I was teaching and preaching, and it was Joseph Smith, the uh, first vision, the angel Moroni, and uh, John the Baptist, Peter, James, and the whole story. And I hardly said anything about Jesus Christ. But uh, throughout the book of Acts, you find it, Acts 8, 5, Acts 8, verse 35, Acts 9, 20, they were preaching Jesus, mm -hmm. and I wasn't. And uh, I remembered that when I got to Galatians chapter 1, by the way, when Paul said, though we are an angel, preach any other gospel unto you than that which we have preached, let him be accursed. And I, I realized that... That really that, sunk uh, in. It, it did strike me. And then you went and, to the book of Romans. Yeah. It was in Romans, really, that I... I uh, began to put things together. I had always been taught that the whole idea of justification by faith was a pernicious doctrine, that it was a sectarian dogma. Who said that? Well, Talmadge, for example, in the Articles of Faith, talks about it. One uh, of the apostles in the Mormon Church? Yeah, he's one of their great apostles, one of their great theologians. But, for example, he says it on page 479 in the Articles of Faith. The sectarian dogma of justification by faith alone is exercised an influence for evil. He says this is a pernicious doctrine. And uh, that's the only way that I had heard it referred to, really. But you, but you looked, we got about 30 seconds left, you looked at what? Uh, in Romans chapter 5, verse 1, Therefore, being justified by faith, we have, present tense, peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. I said, that's what I've been working for. That's what I want, peace with God. And I prayed, and I asked the Lord to give it to me, and I, did, I believe that he did give it to me even that evening, even though I didn't know what to call On it or what On the basis happened. of the scripture yes. of trusting in Christ. Right. We want to talk more about that, and then we want to come to the great-great-granddaughter of Brigham Young, who also, through her research, broke away from the Mormon faith. We want to hear all about that when we come right back. All right, Sandra, you are the great-great-granddaughter of Brigham Young. And to many Mormons that are listening right now, they want to know, how could you? How could you the great-great-granddaughter of the second prophet of the Mormon Church. How in the world could you leave the Mormon Church? What happened to you? My mother and father were married in the Salt Lake Temple and had both come from extremely fanatic Mormon homes. All they had ever known all their life had been a small Mormon community and uh, this had been their total environment until the time they got married. But then, uh, right after the time I was born, they moved to Southern California. And for the first time in their lives, they were in a different culture. And they found out there were people that weren't Mormons. And they were confronted with different lifestyles, different beliefs. And this was all uh, uh, kind of a jolt to them. And as my mother uh, had different things uh, come to her attention, she started to wonder about the claims of Mormonism. So when I was a teenager in high school, my mother started studying Mormon doctrine and history for herself to see if there were any problems or how it all checked out. She raised these issues to me, and uh, we argued about Mormonism. I would defend the church. She would raise the questions. I would go back to my seminary teacher. This is the high school 
uh, off-campus religious instruction that Mormon kids get. I would go to my seminary teacher and I'd say, what about this? My mother asked me this, 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 this. How do I respond to this? What are the answers? And my seminary teacher uh, was very sincere and tried to help me, but she really didn't know the answers. And it would usually end up, you go home and pray about it, and God will give you the answer. What kind of questions did your mom have? What did it revolve around? What, what did you guys argue about? Well, she had gone into a lot of the historical aspects of Mormonism, also into a lot of the doctrinal. For instance, the idea of Elohim and Jehovah was one thing that particularly we went the rounds on. In uh, Mormonism, they make Elohim the Father God, Jehovah is Jesus. So this makes the problem when you're studying the Old Testament, how do you determine when the God it's referring to is God the Father or God the Son, since they make them two totally separate people. So my, my mother asked me this one day. She says, you're studying Old Testament in seminary. How do they explain Elohim Jehovah? So off I go to my seminary teacher. My mother wants to know. And then uh, my uh, seminary teacher's answer essentially was, usually it's Jehovah in the Old Testament. But there are those specific verses where it's referring to Elohim. And what it broke down to was the ones that they would like to use to prove that God the Father had a physical body. Moses talked to the Lord face to face. Okay, that must be Elohim because that helps establish that God the Father has a physical form. So this was a, I mean, the way they were determining which was which. It was just a matter of proof text, what ones they wanted to be Elohim or Jehovah. Well, uh, I hadn't had any real Bible training, but I thought that didn't sound very systematic or scientific to me. It seemed like there ought to be a better way. I didn't know that you could just go to the Hebrew Bible and see when it said Elohim or Jehovah. Well, I thought, well, I can't go home and tell my mother that. She's going to see right through that. Well, of course, my seminary teacher's usual response, well, you go home and pray about it. You know, well, you can pray and pray and pray, but if you don't study the Hebrew, you're not going to know when it and says again, Elohim. by your praying, it doesn't, your prayers do not change the it text. Does, yes, it doesn't resolve what the documents say. So the, I had a lot of problems with my mother as a teenager. Then when I got into college, I went to the Mormon Institute of Religion, which is their college instruction uh, for Mormons. And I started asking different questions that came up there. Finally, the instructor became threatened with my questioning in class. And he took me aside one day and he said, Sandra, please stop asking questions in class. You're disturbing a girl that's here investigating Mormonism. Well, that disturbed me. I wouldn't have left Mormonism over that, but it made me wonder why he didn't have the answers and felt threatened. Is there any kind of pressure put on people that ask a whole lot of questions? Yes, there is an intimidation factor. If you're a Mormon, you accept the prophet as God's spokesman. If you ask a question about any of the references, there's a basic implication that you don't trust his word. And so there is a sort of uh, guilt trip put on you, uh, do you feel you're smarter than the prophet? Are you more holy? You have more wisdom and insight? You think you know more about this than the prophet? If the prophet said that, it ought to be sufficient. So you were defending Mormonism to your mother, and then her questions. But going to the church on the side and saying, what do I say to this woman? They and they say, the answers. pray about it. And I was praying, but it still wasn't resolving the specific issues. And it was at this time that I met Gerald. and. Gerald and I started dating. Gerald at this point had left Mormonism. He was born and raised in it also. He had left Mormonism and had started studying the different Mormon books, the history and the changes. And he challenged me. He said, Sandra, it's not like they told you in Sunday school and I can prove it to you. He said, here is a photograph of the first printing of Joseph Smith's Revelations. All you have to do is lay it down to the side of the current Doctrine and Covenants and you'll see they don't read the same. So I did. I sat down and literally read through the entire first printing of the Joseph Smith's Revelations, which is called the Book of Commandments. It was printed in 1833. And I read through that entire book parallel to the side of the Doctrine and Covenants and marked all the changes. And by the time I got comparing all the changes made in the Revelations, I thought, this can't be God. The creator of the universe surely would be able to do something right the first time. He wouldn't have to go back and rewrite it all. Well, that was one of the problems I had. Then Gerald said, uh, since you're a descendant of Brigham Young, and I had a really big uh, head over this, he said, have you ever read any of Brigham Young's sermons? I said, no. Well, now this seemed pretty safe. I mean, after all, how can you get in trouble reading Brigham Young's right. sermons? So I didn't know he was setting me up. He said, uh, if I bring over some of Brigham Young's sermons, will you read them? I said, sure. Now, in the Mormon church, we've got to refresh people's memory about Brigham Young. Brigham Young was? The second president of the Mormon Church, their second prophet, Joseph Smith's successor. Okay, and when he spoke, that is what? 
Yes, Brigham Young said that uh, he, when he sent a sermon out to the world, you could consider it scripture. So that's the very words of God right. that people need to and know about. And in the Mormon uh, Sunday School Manual today, it says that God will never allow the living prophet to lead the saints astray. He'll never let him teach false doctrine. So that's, so how, that's, you, the that's concept. how you approached that's it. That's how I looked at this. So Gerald comes over with several volumes of the Journal of Discourses. Now this is a 26 volume set of books that records the early sermons of the pioneer Mormon leadership, Brigham Young and the few presidents after him. And in these volumes were all sorts of doctrines I had never heard before. There was Adam God doctrine, where Brigham Young said that Jesus' father was Adam, not Elohim, that Elohim was an overseer God and that he sent Adam to be the God for this world. And that Adam literally came to Mary to procreate Jesus. Well, that was a whole new thing to me. I'd never heard Adam God doctrine. It wasn't just one sermon. There were, there were many on this. There were other concepts in there, uh, blood atonement. Was he the first one to introduce that, by the way? Well, he is the first one to introduce it in print. He said he learned it from Joseph Smith, mm -hmm. but if he did, the documents haven't survived on it. But he was and the first one to publicly Smith print it. And what Joseph Smith said in print contradicted what Brigham Young had in print. Right, because Joseph Smith said that uh, Elohim was the father of Jesus, and now Brigham Young stepping it down a step, he's saying Adam is the father of Jesus. So you had a contradiction right off the bat. What right. else? So uh, the sermons of Brigham Young, there was one uh, called Blood Atonement. And this is the concept that if you committed certain sins after you went through the temple, you could forfeit your place in the top Mormon heaven unless you personally atoned for it by the shedding of your own blood. So that if you went through the temple after that committed adultery, that in order to have forgiveness, to still go to the Mormon's highest heaven, you personally had to shed your blood to gain forgiveness. You had your own neck slit so that your blood would sh be shed as an atonement. This absolutely floored me. I, I had never heard such doctrines. They don't say it that way today, but that's what was being taught by Brigham Young, sermon after sermon after sermon. What, did the Mor what does the Mormon church say about those sermons of their prophet many years ago? They try to excuse it by saying he was merely talking about capital punishment. It was capital punishment, but it went to it a quite a long list of crimes. Mm -hmm. It wasn't just for murder. You could get blood atoned for uh, committing adultery, for marrying a black, uh, for stealing, for lying. There were a whole host of things that you could get blood atoned for. Now, fortunately, the Mormon people didn't always take his sermons that seriously, so not very many people were blood atoned. But I can document instances of people who were. Hmm. Okay, we've got about two minutes left. So as I studied Mormon history, Mormon doctrine, as I compared it to the Bible, as I compared it to the Book of Mormon, I realized this was all different than I'd ever been taught. And in the process of studying the Bible, I started to realize that uh, what God was saying there was very different than what I'd heard in Mormonism. When I read in 1 John where it says that uh, we love him because he first loved us, and I started to comprehend God's love was coming out to me as sinner, not me a God in embryo, that I didn't have any claim on God's forgiveness, any claim on God's love. I wasn't anyone. I couldn't stand up to God and say, hey, look, I'm really somebody, somebody, I'm going to be a goddess. And I saw that what the Bible was saying about me was that I was a lost sinner, that I had no hope in myself. I had to turn myself over to Christ for total salvation, not just in the gate, but total salvation was through faith in Christ. And then one day you did that. Yes. One day I listened to a Christian radio program where they were speaking on the love of God, showing that man had no claim on that love. It was a free gift. In spite of my sin, God still loved me and offered me this free gift if I would just accept it. And as I listened to that radio station and to that program, I gave my heart to the Lord. Okay. And you invited the Lord into your life. What, what happened with your parents? Uh, my family were very upset with this decision. I think they were more upset with me becoming a Christian than leaving Mormonism. That was the big offense. My mother had already been questioning Mormonism. Because Mormons look at the Christian church as what? As in total apostasy. Total apostasy. Every Christian church in existent, existence is apostate. Right. But one of the real objections my family had was this idea of saying that I was lost and needed to be saved. That was a real offense. To a Mormon, no one is really lost and needing to be saved. So by implication, if I said I was lost and needed Christ as Savior, then wasn't I also saying that they were lost and needed Christ as Savior? And uh, I had different ones in my family say to me, I sin, but I'm not a sinner. And to them, 
they didn't like the implication that there was something basically wrong with them. You know, they just fudged a little here and there, but mm -hmm. they weren't really bad. And that's where the whole problem comes in in trying to witness to your Mormon friend. They don't see themselves as really needing God's total forgiveness. And, but you were still concerned about your mom, and you started yes. to write some of the information down so that you could persuade your mother that the historical information, the doctrinal information in the Mormon scriptures was wrong. And would you hold up that book? Yes. Talk about a, a, a daughter writing her mother a letter. <laughs> Gerald and I both had Mormon family that still believed very strongly in Mormonism. We still do. Gerald has family and I have family that still are extremely active in Mormonism. When we left, they said, why in the world would you two young people leave Mormonism? And so we wrote up some of our reasons. This, not this at first, but just mimeographed off little pages and gave it to everyone we knew. When I left the church, I sent a mimeographed set of information to everyone in my ward, every Mormon I knew and everyone in my family, and uh, didn't convert them all. Uh, in fact, it made them all very mad, and I got a lot of hate letters. What is that that you're holding? That is a book that represents all our research we've done for the last 22 years. And in there, you've got what? In here, I have documented all the things we've been talking about on these different programs. This gives you all of these problems of Mormonism and the references. And how many pages is that book? It's almost 600 pages. And you wrote that for your mother so she would know the truth. Yes. And it's also available to anybody that wants to look at it. Right. All right, next week we're going to come back and we're going to talk about such things as Mormon doctrine concerning the black people. We're going to talk about the Mormon doctrine concerning women and their place. Can a woman by herself, not being married, become God? If she is married and she does become God, what does she do as Mother God? I want to hear some of those things that you found out in your research and we'll look into it next week. Welcome to our program. And we have with us uh, Marvin Cowan, and we have Sandra Tanner, the great-great-granddaughter of uh, Brigham Young. And folks, we want to pick up this week on the area of, uh, let's first of all, start with something that's been in the news quite a bit that we, as non-Mormons, do not understand. And that is, there seems to be uh, a controversy about black people. Okay, can you start us off at the beginning and, and bring us up to speed right where we're at right now in terms of Mormon doctrine concerning black people. What did Joseph Smith or Brigham Young or the early prophets say about black people? Why are they black? Well, they believe that in the pre-existence, some of God's children weren't as faithful as others and didn't deserve to have the priesthood when they came to this earth. So that... Uh, so God had said, here's a certain group of people that shouldn't have priesthood on their earth experience. But the problem being, when we get down here, we don't remember the prior existence, so we don't remember who God said doesn't get it. Mm -hmm. So he said, when Cain killed Abel, he put the mark of the black skin and the negroid features and made them black uh, to distinguish them. And then from then on, all of these spirits that weren't to get priesthood were to come through that line. So all you had to determine was that who is the descendant of Cain, and you would know which spirits don't get the priesthood. So here's a statement by uh, Brigham Young. This is in the Journal of Discourses. This is volume seven. Before you read that, ask, answer the question, why was it so important that they be included or excluded from the priesthood? What is the priesthood? Well, in order to progress to godhood, a Mormon has to hold the priesthood. Uh, this is all tied to the temple ritual. Uh, the Melchizedek priesthood where you have to become a, an elder to go through the Mormon temple. In other words, you have to hold that office in your working uh, to please God, to become yes. God. You have to prove yourself. You have to be able to hold that office. Right. But so by the blacks not having the priesthood to stop their eternal progression, they could never reach the position of being a god. And so you're saying that the, the prophet said through revelation that God had excluded them because of what? What did they do? Well, they aren't very clear on that. They just weren't as faithful in the pre-existence as In other we words, were. up there in heaven someplace, or up there mm -hmm. in eternity, mm -hmm. those spirit children... They did children, something that disqualified them. They did them. something that God didn't like, and so he made this fiat ruling, this, right. this command, that they couldn't be in the priesthood, so they would never reach God. Well. Right. And Brigham Young says, How long is that race to endure the dreadful curse that is upon them? That curse will remain upon them, and they never can hold the priesthood 
or share in it until all the other descendants of Adam have received the promises and enjoyed the blessings of the priesthood and the keys thereof until the last one of the residue of Adam's children are brought up to that favorable position, the children of Cain cannot receive the first ordinances of the priesthood. They were the first that were cursed, and they will be the last from whom the curse will be removed. However, we have in 1978, Spencer W. Kimball changing the doctrine. Who is the current president. Current prophet. Prophet. And he says he prayed about this because of all the problems that were uh, uh, being raised in contentions that he supposedly got a revelation. So, so he had the first revelation that you just read that yes. said they can't be there. And now they Kimball comes along in 1978 and says what? Okay, if you get a uh, current Mormon Doctrine and Covenants, in it now is the statement on the blacks where Kimball says in June 8th, uh, he says, uh, aware of the promises made by the prophets and presidents of the church have preceded us, so forth, uh, witnessing the faithfulness, wait a minute, I'm skipping something, in God's eternal plan, all of our brethren who are worthy may receive the priesthood. That's the catchphrase. So he's now changed it to where all of the brethren who are worthy can hold the priesthood, where before it was all the brethren other than blacks could hold the priesthood. So this is their statement, declaration now stating, it doesn't specifically say blacks, but that's what it's about, is that blacks now can be included in the priesthood if and they're they faithful. they can become God now. Now they can go on into the temple and do their temple work and become a God. Prior to the revelation, this changed. They couldn't go to the temple and be married for eternity. All right, let me ask you a question. If now blacks can make it, all right, can blacks go into the temple and be baptized or have something happen that, that's retroactive to, that, to those black relatives of theirs that couldn't make it before under, what was it, Brigham Young? Mm -hmm. Yes. Now a uh, black could go and do his genealogy and take care of all the ones that got passed over by Brigham Young. However, Brigham Young said that everyone else had to have a chance first before the blacks got the priesthood. So you have contradictory revelation. So God changed his mind in essence. Right. And this is the whole problem with Mormonism, that we go through all their doctrines, so you can see time after time after time where God reverses himself all through. And to me, this isn't the God of Christianity. You actually wrote another book on just the doctrines of Mormonism that have changed, haven't you? Yes, I have a little pamphlet called The Bible and Mormon Doctrine that goes into all of their beliefs. Marv's book goes into a lot of the changes in their doctrines also. All right, let's, let's jump to another topic on this thing uh, uh, of women, okay? Uh, We've talked about the fact that you've got Father God and you've got Mother God, mm -hmm. all right? And uh, it's understood that men can uh, uh, progress to Godhood. Can women progress to God, to being a God, Mother God? They become a goddess, but uh, they are not worshipped or addressed in prayer or spoken to. In fact, most Mormons hardly ever refer to the Mother God. She's sort of a, a shadowy figure, a second-class deity She's there, but her function in life is to have children. In fact, in the Mormon Sunday School Manual uh, that we showed on another program, it says in here that the uh, primary, most important role of the woman is to have children. That is their view, because in the hereafter, that is her whole job, is to have these 20 million children or whatever that are going to come to her husband's earth. Can a woman attain being a goddess if she's not married? No. Can but a man, a man can't either without being okay, married. Okay, so you've got to be married in order to have to be a god. Right. Okay, so this is why there's such pressure on this thing of not being divorced in the Mormon church? Yes, you want to keep this eternal marriage bond. Uh, if you go through the temple, you will have that mate for all eternity. So it's not so much the fact of love for each other as the fact you've got an ulterior motive. You want to become god. Yes, you've got to have this eternal union. You have to have a mate in order to produce all these spirit children. You have to produce the spirit children to start your earth. Did I read that if you, uh, you've got three stages of heaven, and in the third stage where you can become mm -hmm. uh, God, if you don't attain being a god or a goddess, you become uh, an angel. Yes. Now, the god or goddess, if you reach that stage, you can have sex eternally, correct? Mm -hmm. But if you are in the second or third stage down below, you can't have sex, correct? That's right. The Mormons would say that there will be a change made in everyone's body that doesn't make the top of the top Mormon heaven. And only the Mormons that have had temple marriage will be able to have intercourse. And of course, the whole, only point of the intercourse is to have these 20 million babies to start your own earth. 
Yeah, from a woman's perspective, if she becomes a goddess, what does she have to look forward to as being a goddess? Eternal diaper changing, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> okay. She is going to go off and you're going to create and populate your own world. Yes. And the gestation period is still nine months per kid? That's what I'm told. Uh, the Mormons don't really uh, talk about that. this very much in their literature, but as you grow up in the church, this is your understanding that it will be a full uh, length pregnancy, full concept of the whole do process. Any, do any of the women in the Mormon church kind of rebel against this thing? It seems like the man has primary position. Yes, it's a very hard thing. You don't want 20 million children. The other thing is, do Mormons still believe in polygamy? Yes, the Mormons still believe in polygamy. It's still in the Doctrine and Covenants. It's section 132. It's still in the Doctrine and Covenants today. Okay, who started this thing of polygamy? In other words, you can have more than one wife. Joseph Smith started it. Uh, he originally started it in secret, though, and although he was secretly living it, he was... What do you mean he started it in secret? That he was just practicing it in secret? He wasn't teaching it in secret, or...? Well, uh, there were accusations made that he was having affairs with different women. Oliver Cowdery, who was one of the witnesses to the Book of Mormon, accused Joseph Smith of having an adulterous affair with a girl named Fanny Alger. And uh, there were these kind of stories, charges, coming up in the church. But there was a select group of people that Joseph Smith taught this doctrine, but it was not taught openly in the church, so that I can show you statements in uh, church chronicles during Joseph Smith's lifetime where he denied polygamy at the very time he was living it. He denied it. He lied about it while he yes. was living in it. Yes. Okay, then who made it formal? In other words, who, who made it doctrine? Well, Brigham Young was the first one to publicly teach it. Brigham Young announced it in uh, 1852 was when the church officially out in the open came out and said, we believe in polygamy. By but the they'd way, been living it for years. By the way, doesn't the reorganized church of Jesus Christ don't they believe that Joseph Smith is their prophet as well? Yes. Okay. What but do they, they don't accept polygamy. They, yeah, they, they base don't. their stand on the printed testimony of Joseph Smith. They say, look, I can show you in church What do they records. do with his living record? In other words, what do they do with the fact that he actually lived that when they say that, you know, you're not supposed to? They just won't believe any of the uh, people's accounts that he was living it. They say they were all uh, unreliable witnesses and they won't accept their testimony on it. Okay, Brigham Young made it official printed wise, even though Joseph Smith was living polygamy while he was denying it. Uh, how many wives can a, a Mormon man have? No one knows for sure. Brigham Young had uh, uh, maybe 56 or so wives. Can a woman but have... But he didn't have the most. There were Mormons with more. Can a, can a Mormon woman have uh, many men? No, Why not? Be because the process, the whole point of polygamy was to have your spirit children faster so you could start your earth faster. So if, you, if a man has 100 wives, he can get his babies born 100 times faster. He can get his world populated quicker. Yes, but a woman can only have so many children, no matter how many husbands she has. Because she's got to have them. Right. So it only works in the one way. The man needs more wives. All right, now that is actually doctrine or revelation that came through the prophets. Yes. Now, is it that way today? The Mormons do not believe in practicing it, but they still believe it. For instance, in my own family, my grandmother and grandfather were married in the temple. My grandmother died. My grandfather remarried another woman who had never been married. They married in the temple. So according to the Mormons, my grandfather will be a polygamist in heaven because he's been married to two women in the temple. So they believe it's a valid doctrine People today still can be entering into a polygamous marriage if the husband's lucky enough to have his wife die first where he can marry another woman and have her sealed to him, then he'll have those wives in the hereafter. What do they do with scripture that says in heaven there is neither uh, marriage or giving of marriage, in marriage? They say that's true because the people Jesus was talking to were Pharisees and they wouldn't have got married in the temple. So, of course, for them, there will be no marriage in heaven. So, actually, they have to go outside of scripture Yes. to contradict that because otherwise, otherwise it sounds like a blanket statement. You right. have to get other revelation, you go out to these other books. Right. Okay. Um, maybe some of you have some questions out here. You have a question? Come on up. What I'd like to, to ask about or find out some information about is this concept of hell. If I, if I don't uh, encompass any uh, of the Mormon doctrines and I'm a murderer or, or anything like this, uh, do I go to hell? And if I do, what is hell? 
Okay. In Mormonism, uh, when you die, you will go to either paradise or spirit prison. So that uh, the Mormons go to paradise and the bad guys go to the spirit prison. And that's a form of hell. You will be there for a thousand years until, uh, through the millennium, until the resurrection for the judgment. And then at that time, you supposedly have been purged from your sins and are repented, and then you will be able to go to one of the Mormon heavens. Uh, if you had been a murderer, that means you would go to the celestial kingdom, the bottom level of heaven. Uh, if you were just a nice Protestant, uh, but you never embraced Mormonism, then you'll go to the terrestrial kingdom. So there is no eternal punishment as such? So there's no eternal punishment as such? Well, only for a few. They believe that there is a group called Sons of Perdition that have eternal hell. And that would be, of course, Lucifer uh, and Cain and Judas, uh, people that have had direct revelation of Jesus Christ and then denied it. Then they can go to eternal hell, but most people don't. How did Lucifer and uh, Jesus, apparently they were brothers. Yes. How, what was the split? How did Lucifer become the devil? What's the story? Well, when God was ready to start his earth, he called a council meeting of all the family. That was all of us and Jesus and our brother Lucifer. We were all there. And Jesus and Lucifer were both uh, proposing their plans for running the earth. And according to Mormon teaching now. Yes. And Jesus and God agreed that they wanted to send everyone to earth with free agency, and only those that choose to obey would come back to the Father's presence. While Lucifer said, let's send them all to earth. I'll make sure they all obey, and I'll make sure everyone comes back to heaven. And God said, no, I'm going to go this other route, and uh, Jesus is going to be my savior for the earth. Lucifer rebelled and got one-third of God's family to rebel, and they termed this the war in heaven. And Lucifer and one-third of God's children made war on the other two-thirds. To stop it, God cast out Lucifer and the one-third of his children, and they become the evil forces on this earth. Okay. This may be just a little ludicrous, but uh, again, I guess it's not, it's not one about, about one of the deeper doctrines, but I read that Joseph uh, Smith, when he was a prophet living, made the statement that the moon was inhabited with beings, and he went into great detail to describe these people. And of course, our shuttle went up there not long ago and landed on the moon, and, and the fellow got out on the moon, couldn't even find anybody to play golf with, and the, all the rest of the time, the other guy was going around the moon, and he never saw anybody. And So what do they say about that, since he claims to be the prophet of God, and what he says is inspired of God. Yeah, do they actually claim that? Mormons today aren't aware that Joseph made that claim. But in our book, I have a photograph. This is uh, from the Young Women's Journal, which was a Mormon church publication. Mm -hmm. And this is printed in 1892. This is uh, a church article in a church magazine by a prominent church leader who knew Joseph Smith. And he recounts in here about uh, Joseph Smith telling him about the men on the moon. And he says, nearly all the great discoveries of men in the last half century have in one way or another, either directly or indirectly, contributed to prove Joseph Smith to be a prophet. So you see this man's favorable to Joseph Smith. As far back as 1837, I know that he said the moon was inhabited by men and women the same as this earth, and that they live to a greater age than we do, that they live generally to near the age of a thousand years, he described the men as averaging near six feet in height and dressing quite uniformly in something near the Quaker style. And then he goes on to talk about um, he was promised that uh, when he got to a certain age, he would go out and preach the gospel, and that came true. He had also been promised that he would one day go to the moon and teach to the inhabitants there. And since the first promise had been fulfilled, he was sure of the second promise. Now, it's not recorded that he ever went. But this was a faithful follower of Joseph Smith, giving his reminiscence as the prophet, and he said he was taught this. What do Mormons say when you show that stuff to them? Uh, they don't know quite what to say. They probably would uh, argue something to the effect that they never heard of the Young Women's Journal. How do I know that was a church publication? Okay. Uh, a little earlier during a break, we were talking with you privately, Sandra, about uh, how you approach Mormons uh, uh, with the way of salvation and what is the best way. But what I would like to ask is, how do you approach someone who has professed to be a Christian and has been a member uh, of a denominational church and then becomes a Mormon and is very, very active in the Mormon church? If you're concerned about this person as a member of your family or whatsoever, how do you go about talking to them about salvation? Good question. Well, it, it's really hard. Uh, 
if the person does not want to consider any of the evidence, you can't force it down their throat. But you have to try to challenge them that truth will stand up to investigation. If what you believe is really true, you have no reason to fear looking at what I would consider would to be problem areas if it's really true. So that I try to challenge a Mormon that if he really has a testimony the church is true, then he'll be able to tell me where I'm wrong. And he'll be able to show me that my quotes are out of context, that they're misleading or whatever. He'll be able to show me those things. Now I've documented for him where the problems are at. Could they show me that that's wrong? But you have to some way try to get them to think this through. If it's true, it should all fit together. I'm not afraid to have them look at the Bible. I'd be glad to sit down and talk to them about the Bible. Why aren't they willing to sit down and talk with me about their faith and to explain to me what I see are problems in it? What is your answer when you talk with a Mormon and they say, well, the Bible's got corruptions and so that's not the truth? Then I have to challenge them uh, on the basis, can you give me an example? Can you show me where it's changed? Where has the teaching been uh, obliterated or misconstrued or left out or corrupted? Uh, we can go back to the Greek manuscripts and establish what the Bible taught back at uh, 200 AD. And it taught the same thing then that it teaches now. So the Mormon doesn't realize he's just parroting what he's always been told. He has to be challenged that uh, you can't document this problem with the Bible that you keep talking about. Have you ever stopped to think about this? Where are the problems? How was it changed? Who changed it? When was it changed? Can you give me any examples of this? Yeah, and the Dead Sea Scrolls brought us back a thousand years in textual criticism, and we found out that the texts were almost exact, so there's no problem there. Where does the doctrine of vicarious baptism come from that the Mormons preach? Did you want to take that one? I don't care. <laughs> they use 1 Corinthians 15, 29 in the Bible as a launching pad. Uh, else what shall they do who are baptized for the dead? If the dead rise not at all, why are they then baptized for the dead? And uh, that, along with the, the Doctrine and Covenants, uh, they have some sections in there that explain baptism for the dead in more detail. But uh, they start with the Bible because we believe the Bible in if they're dealing with non-Mormons, they always like to start with, with the Bible. But of course that passage isn't really saying that uh, Paul was teaching baptism for the dead. In fact, the very next verse, Paul excludes himself. Uh, why stand we in jeopardy every hour? In verse 29, why are they baptizing for the dead? It seems to me he's indicating there's a difference between those that are doing that and uh, those that were with him as, as Christians. But that's where they uh, would would launch out from would be 1 Corinthians 15, 20. How many people of the Mormon church baptized a uh, proxy? I don't know what the current number is. We were looking today, and uh, the latest figures I had was around uh, 1979, and there were just awfully close to 4 million, I believe, uh, proxy baptisms. We've got about a minute left. If you have some Mormon people that are looking in that are saying, hey, I am disillusioned, I have questions, what would you tell them to do to answer their questions and at the same time, not just give up all faith at all? Well, I would say they need to look into the historical foundation for the Bible. Don't just throw it out because you're told it's not reliable. Look into it. It'll stand investigation. But what about your own faith? I can document where the problems are in Mormonism. I can also document where the Bible's reliable. There is faith in Christ. He is true, and he is sufficient for your life. But the Mormon uh, becomes disillusioned. They think, oh, well, if Mormonism isn't true, there's just nothing out there. And Marv and I both can attest that we found a satisfaction in Christ we never had as a Mormon. One final question. The, the Mormon church calls itself the Church of Jesus Christ. What does Jesus do for you now that he didn't do for you when you were inside the Mormon church? What is he to you now that he wasn't inside the Mormon church? Now he's my full salvation, where before he was just a partial uh, incentive in my life. Now he is the whole thing. He gives me his righteousness that's imputed to me, not righteousness I've earned or worked up on my own. And so he is my all in all. Now he is my uh, sufficiency in all things. I can stand before God because of what he did on the cross. Mark? Well, I have a different Jesus now to start with. Um, like Paul mentions in 2 Corinthians 11, uh, some might come preaching another Jesus. And I believe the Jesus of Mormonism really is. Now, the, the average Mormon, like myself, thought uh, or thinks that it's the Jesus 
of the Bible. But the Jesus I worship now isn't uh, a spirit brother of Lucifer and a God and so forth. So what he does now is give me real peace with God. He's my one mediator. Before I had all kinds of things that, that actually function in kind of a mediatorial position. Now Jesus Christ is my all in all. I am complete in him, as Colossians 2.10 says. And in Mormonism, I never was complete. So that's what I found in Christ. Also, you never have assurance of salvation as a Mormon in the ultimate sense. You can't know that you have eternal life until you get up there because you've got to work at it all your life. But as a Christian, we have the assurance that we can know we have eternal life. If there are some Mormon leaders that are watching and they say, you know, I don't like what you folks are saying, can we invite them to come on the program and invite you back sometime? Sure. Absolutely. And we'll debate the evidence. That's yes. a wide open invitation, right? Yes. Glad right. to. With that, we want to say thank you. We thank you for all this information and for your lives that uh, God has wonderfully changed. And uh, thank you for being with us. Mm -hmm.